This is a local Bahraini coin. It is from where I live. What I want you to do is to guess three times whether this coin is going to land on its head side or its tail side. Basically, I'm going to flip it three times and you have to guess the coin flip right every time. So here we go. This is coin flip number one, coin flip number two, and coin flip number three. Now you might be saying, wait, 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 hold on a minute. This completely depends on luck. This doesn't make any sense. This is not how reality works. It doesn't completely depend on luck. And I'll show you later on how you do, in fact, have some control over the probability of a coin flip. Before we go into that, however, you might be saying, wait, how are you qualified to talk about success? You're not exactly this individual, this individual, this individual, or any of these individuals. You're not even that popular on YouTube. There are two reasons. The first reason is that understanding success does not necessarily mean that you will become successful. In fact, by the end of this video, your chances of achieving a particular goal or objective might decrease, not increase because of the psychological impact of understanding success. This is not a self-help video. It's more of an analysis video of what exactly is involved in success. The second reason has to do with the way we think about things. You have to be very careful when you're looking at a successful individual or an organization and start thinking of the reasons why this individual or this organization are in fact very successful. Why? Because you could find yourself caught very quickly in a trap called survivorship bias. It is easy for us to look at an individual or an organization that have already achieved success and start thinking of reasons for why they have achieved success. What is much harder to do is to look at an individual or an organization that will achieve success in the future and start thinking of reasons for why they are eventually going to become successful. Survivorship bias makes us draw this limited picture about what an individual or an organization have gone through until they have become successful. When in reality, it's this multi-dimensional, intricate, complex mess that is very difficult to predict. And I'll show you how this is the case later on. There was an interview that was conducted by a journalist called Stuart Varney who interviewed an economist called Robert Frank who wrote about the role of luck in becoming successful. The journalist did not accept that luck had anything to do with his success at all. And why would he? If I told you that some of your success depended on luck, you might react the same way. However, there was a very important part of the interview that the journalist mentioned, which had a very big part of him being successful, specifically this part. Just as talented, wait a minute, wait a minute. been I, successful. Am I lucky or not? Yes. Who I am and where I am. I'm yes, lucky. You are. Lucky. Okay. And so am I. That's outrageous. That is outrageous. What about the risk I took? Do you know what risk is involved in coming to America with absolutely nothing? Do you know what risk is involved in trying to work for a major American app, uh, network with a British accent, a total foreigner? Do you know what risk is implied for this level of success? I do. He took risks, and risk by definition requires chance in order for you to be able to call it risk. The example in the beginning part of the video is an example of risk. You know that there is a small chance that you can in fact call three coin flips right, but you understand that this is an unlikely outcome. However, in reality, risk is not a fixed number. You can exert effort, you can use resources, you can take actions in order to make risk be in your favor. For example, you go on Google and you type, for example, what affects the probability of a coin flip. And you find this Smithsonian Magazine article that talks exactly about that. In it, they mentioned research that found that most coins, if I show you the face of the coin first, like that, and then flip it, there's a 51% chance that the coin would land on that particular face. Now you've just adjusted the risk slightly to be in your favor. But maybe you're not happy with this. This is a very small increase. So you continue doing your research and you find that there are certain coins because of the existence of some imbalance in the distribution of mass of such coins. They have an 80% chance of landing on one side than the other if they are spun rather than flipped with the heavier side facing down and the lighter side facing up. 
Now you could approach me with one of those coins and say, hey man, could you use this coin instead of the one that you're using? And I would probably say to you, why, why would I do that? And you might have a very convincing argument that can convince me of using your coin instead of mine. Then you would have to follow it up with saying, could you spin this coin rather than flip it? And I would probably say, why again? And if you have a very convincing argument, then you've just increased your chances of succeeding much, much higher than before. The most extreme thing you can do is to build or buy one of those coin flipping machines that get a coin flip right almost 100% of the time. You would also have to convince me to use this machine. A coin flip isn't really random. If you understand the physical processes behind a coin flip and you are able to control these physical processes, there is no randomness and you have in fact the control of the fate of a coin flip. But here is the problem with this analogy, competition. In reality, there is usually other individuals who are trying to achieve the same goal or objective that you are trying to achieve. So we have to adjust this analogy a bit. Imagine now that I want you to guess not a three coin flip sequence, but a 10 coin flip sequence. And the challenge is presented not only to you, but to everyone else who is watching this video right now. And the first individual that calls the coin flip sequence right first will be deemed as the successful individual and everyone else will not be deemed successful. Now things get very interesting. You probably will not have enough time to go on Google and type something that will make the probability of a coin flip be in your favor. You might not have enough time to build one of those coin flipping machines. Why? Because someone else might beat you to the punch and guess the coin flip sequence first before you do. However, this is an extreme example where there is only one winner. In reality, you have more than one winner. Some win more than others and some lose more than others. However, it is possible that we as a society benefit from this competition that happens between us as we are trying to achieve our goals or objectives. For example, education. In education, you have top and low performers. Someone might get an A and someone might get an F, but overall we do benefit as a society from an educated population. And the reverse is true. Wars, you have winners and you have losers. But wars are not a very good thing for the continuation, the long-term continuation of a normal human society. For the purposes of this video, we're not gonna focus on societal success. We're only going to focus on individual success. You have, for example, a lot of people trying to compete in the 100 meter dash race, but usually you only have one winner getting the big share gold, and then you have silver, and then you have bronze, the majority get nothing. Economist Robert Frank, the guy that you've seen in the beginning part of this video and where a lot of this discussion in this video comes from, explains that one of the best decisions that would affect your chances of success is choosing your own parents. Now, you can't choose your own parents, that would be preposterous, but it turns out that your parents have an unbelievable amount of influence on what exactly you're going to end up doing and how successful you're going to be. Work hard, stay determined, never give up. There is a very popular advice traded between people and it might actually be a very good advice because if you look at individuals which we perceive to be successful, they do in fact seem to possess this kind of personality trait. However, even this personality trait can be affected by chance and the main culprit behind it are the kind of genetics that will be passed on from your parents to you and the kind of environment that you're going to grow up in. While this is not the only reason preventing some individuals from staying determined and never giving up, it is a primary reason for why some individuals do not have this personality trait and it is not by any fault of their own. Depression. Depression is an absolutely horrible disease that sucks the motivation to do anything. This is something that I have seen personally in my immediate family. Depression has a genetic link and an environment link. In one particular study, researchers have found a strong link between something called chromosome 3, an area specific in chromosome 3, and that of major depression, especially if the individual has grew up in an environment with heavy smokers. So you have the genetic side and the environment side. Other studies have also found that depression can be contagious. If you have someone who has experienced depression in your close circle of family or friends, then you are in fact more likely to contract depression yourself. It's not really as it's a virus, it's a bit more complicated than that and I do suggest that you read the studies yourself, but it can be 
contagious. But the ability to be determined to never give up is not the only thing that is affected by your environment and by your genetic makeup. Almost everything about you is affected by that. There are cases where environment is more important for that particular thing than genes. And there are some cases where genes are more important than environment. But in either case, you can't really separate the two. It's like asking, what is more important for calculating the area of a rectangle, its width or its length? It doesn't make sense to say that. Now, to give you a sense of everything that we have discussed so far, imagine that we have two individuals who are not born yet and we don't know who their parents are. Their names are, I'm not going to give you actual names because even names affect the chances of an individual's success. So I'm going to give them generic names. Let's say we have individual A and individual B. Now, let's say that the total number of humans who will ever live is around one quadrillion, and we want to calculate the odds of an individual selected at random from this pool of individuals to be able to win specifically the 2020 men Olympic 100 meter dash. Why does it have to be so specific? Because the odds in this case are very easy to calculate. It's one divided by one quadrillion. However, this is only true before we have any information about this individual. We don't know their gender, we don't know what parents they're going to have, we don't know what kind of environment they're going to grow in, and so on and so forth. So both individual A and individual B, their odds of winning the Olympic 2020 100 meter dash are the same. They both have to guess the equivalent of around 50 coin flips. Now let's say we got some information from someone that individual A and individual B are going to be born. They're not born yet. They're going to be born in a time period that allows them to compete in the Olympic 100 meter dash, the 2020 Olympic 100 meter dash. Now, the coin flips they would have had to guess are much less than everyone else in this huge pool of individuals. Now, let's say that we got information about the genetic makeup of the parents of individual A and individual B. Individual A and individual B have not been born yet. Their parents haven't even engaged in the activity that would eventually give birth to individual A and individual B. And after we've analyzed this information, we found out that there is a higher probability that individual A is going to inherit the right physical traits to be able to compete in the 100 meter dash, the 2020 Olympic 100 meter dash, than that of individual B. Now, the chances of success are no longer equal. But let's say even with the odds stacked against him, individual B did in fact get the right physical traits that would allow him to compete in the 100 meter dash. And he got traits that are better than individual A. Now, it doesn't matter what happened in the past, they only have to focus on the future actions that they would need to take. But remember, these are still just babies. They haven't really been able to work hard or smart just yet. Now, this is only the genetic part. After they are born, they have to grow in their respective environments. And what do you know? We've just received some information about this environment. Let's say that individual A was born in an area that loves sports, a community that engages in sports quite a bit, parents that are very sports interested people, and he had the facilities to be able to practice competing in the Olympic 100 meter dash. Why, let's say individual B was born in an area that's not so favorable to sports. Say, for example, like Syria, which has gone through quite a rough war. Now, after the childhood period of both individual A and individual B, both individual A and individual B were able to gain the personality trait of staying determined, never giving up, working hard and smart. Now, this is the part where their own personal effort comes in in order to adjust their chances of achieving success and competing in the Olympic 100 meter dash. Now, let's say that after all of what they've gone through and the circumstances that they've had, individual A's chances of winning the Olympic 100 meter dash are equivalent to guessing, let's say, one coin flip, while individual B are equivalent to guessing, let's say, five coin flips. And let's say even with the odds stacked against him, individual B did in fact make it to the finals of the 100 meter dash and individual A is standing right there next to him. Now, the reason I did not make the chance 
of success for individual A to be 100% is because chance is always a factor. Imagine that they are about to start, and as they are about to start, the universe suddenly decided to transition from a false vacuum state to a true vacuum state, creating this bubble that expands at the speed of light, deleting existence as we know it, and the laws of physics as we know them. This is a thing that might actually happen. It's called vacuum decay, and it can happen at any time, at any location. It's very unlikely that it's going to happen at the exact location of the Olympic 100 meter dash, but it might happen, and you can see how chance is always a factor. In summary, I would like to quote an individual who pretty much everyone perceive as a very successful individual. He said this, I happen to have a talent for allocating capital, but my ability to use that talent is completely dependent on the society I was born into. If I'd been born into a tribe of hunters, this talent of mine would be pretty worthless. I can't run very fast. I'm not particularly strong. I'd probably end up as some wild animal's dinner. But I was lucky enough to be born into a time and place where society values my talent and gave me a good education to develop that talent. And set up the laws and the financial system to let me do what I love doing and make a lot of money doing it. That has been my take on is there a secret to success? Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.